Well, I got to tell you, I've had I've had more reaction to this paper title than I think I've ever had for any of the other uh, probably dozens of papers that I've done over the years. So, I'm I'm here to talk about smooth asset workflows, Bigfoot, and UFOs. <laughs> Three mythical entities. <laughs> <laughs> that we suspect, yeah, they might exist, but there's no real proof. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> this can't possibly be. <laughs> Don't watch the Fox Network. <laughs> well, I guess I stand, uh, I stand corrected. Uh, do you guys want some, uh, some representation up here? Or? <laughs> you demand representation. Well, who? who? <laughs> they appear to be accredited uh, attendees of the conference, so I'm not sure I can kick them out of here. So, um, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, is it okay that we it's, have a couple uh, it's of It's acceptable panels? that they sit here at the panel, yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, okay, maybe they're not so mythical then. I don't know. <laughs> you see, there's one missing here. It's the smooth asset workflows. That's, uh, that's, strange, that's strangely not my role. Here. <laughs> well, let's proceed. So if you, try, if you want to prove that something mythical exists, you look for evidence, right? Photographic evidence is a good place to start. Everybody's probably seen this picture in the past, and well, well I guess we don't need the picture now that we've got uh, our, our special guest here. Um, so we, you know, we look for evidence like that, or um, I don't want to leave our other panelists out. You, you, you see you know, blurry kind of evidence that, okay, yeah, maybe it exists, I don't know. It's, Looks possible. The best I could find for smooth asset workflows was another blurry black and white picture here. And I don't, I don't know if that really proves the existence of it or not, but uh, it's could, the best I could find out there. So could be Philo Farnsworth. Yeah. <laughs> so I, the photographic evidence, it's kind of sketchy on all three counts, but you know, let's, let's delve in here a little bit more. So. Um, with apologies to my, my fellow panelists here, uh, I am going to focus on the smooth asset workflows. Uh, since they don't seem to be represented here, I'm going to stand up for them. <laughs> what are these? What are we talking about here? We've been talking about this sort of concept for years, and I'm not sure we've ever seen sufficient evidence that it actually exists. Um, the differences uh, between pr uh, programs and commercials, we'll look a little bit at, at that, uh, some of the impacts of multi-platform uh, delivery, uh, look a little bit at advanced advertising, and then most importantly, identifying um, content in, uh, in, in, for smooth asset workflows. And then finally, uh, a little survey of some tools that might help uh, to, uh, to enable these. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, so let's start to deconstruct the term. Uh, asset workflows, okay, we all kind of know what that means, but what do I really mean when I say smooth? What, what really is smooth? Well, I like, uh, I'm an acronym guy, I'm a software guy, so I like to make up acronyms for the, these things. So I'm, my mantra with, with smooth when it comes to asset workflows is, is, is MMA, and um, nope, that's the, that's the wrong one, sorry. That, <laughs> apologies to Viacom there. What it, what it really is is minimize manual actions. There's my acronym for, uh, for what is smooth. So really what our goal is here uh, is we want to try, if we're going to have smooth asset workflows, we have to reduce the duplication of effort. Uh, you notice I didn't say eliminate. I'm trying to be realistic here, but reduce. Uh, and it not only talks to the cost side of things, but it also talks to the introduction of errors. Anytime that you have a duplication uh, of entry of, uh, of data or duplication of efforts at any point in the workflow process, you're going to introduce errors. It's just inevitable. We're human. Uh, it's, it, that's going to happen. So. Those are a couple of the primary goals here in trying to enable smooth asset workflows. And as I said earlier, one of the challenges we've got in the media business here is we really seem to have two different workflows. When you deal with program content and then advertising relating content, related content, they're not exactly the same and they imply different workflows in a lot of cases. And we really can't apply one single workflow uh, to both of these. Uh, but we need to obviously address both somehow. And then, you know, we've got the issue of, you know, wasn't this simpler a few years ago when we had a single channel and we were just delivering the content to, uh, uh, to our traditional viewers, but where you've got multiple delivery platforms, 
you know, maybe you got away with some less than smooth workflows in the past, but when you, you've got these multiple delivery platforms, it tends to expose issues that you might have gotten away with, uh, again, in the, in the past. So another challenge for us. And then if that wasn't complex enough, let's throw in what we've been calling recently advanced advertising here. So, you know, the, okay, yeah, we're sending the program out to people on mobile, over the web, traditional, satellite, cable, whatever, but we complicate it further by saying, well, why don't we increase some interactivity for people with commercials? Because you know, God knows it's hard enough to get them to pay attention to the commercials the way they are right now. So let's, let's get them more engaged in it. Let's address them a little bit better. Uh, and, and I'll deal with this a little bit later uh, in, in some more detail. But just keep in mind for now, this is just a, yet another challenge that we, we seem to keep throwing these things our way uh, in, in making our, our, uh, our quest for these smooth asset workflows more and more difficult. But really the key, let's start, start at fundamentals here. If we're, if we're gonna make this all work, we need to be able to identify these assets. Um, and you know, if, if, if anybody's got the number for NASA or uh, uh, the Wildlife Service, uh, you might wanna call them to do some identification of these, uh, <laughs> these characters over here. Um, but it's the same deal with, uh, with, with, with assets. If, if we can't identify them, how can we enable smooth workflows? Uh, and there's really a few, in my view, critical aspects to identification. It's not just slapping a number on it and say, hey, we're good, we've identified it. We need to ensure that whatever identification means we use, it has to be globally unique. Um, you know, a lot of the content that we're sending around the world now is, um, uh, is, like, is global. It, it's, it's being sent uh, via different distribution platforms to different people in different parts of the world, so you need to think on a global basis for this. Um, needs to be easy to manage, like anything. If it isn't easy to manage, people aren't going to use it. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, it's, it's got to be cost effective. Uh, you, you can have the most wonderful solution in the world, and if it's not cost effective, nobody's going to use it. So with that, uh, I, ha I, ha I have an expert in, I in asset identification in Harold Geller here, and I'd like to pass the podium to him for a little while, and let's deal with this core issue of uh, identification. Were you going to talk about SIM? Were you going to talk about SIM, no? You got SIM. The next section is SIM. You were to talk about that. SIM. Yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, that's okay. Okay, I'll do it. All right. So, next slide. So, the Coalition for Innovative Media, Media Measurement did a uh, project called TAXI, the Trackable Asset Identification Cross Industry Initiative and found that the industry needs ways to track assets across platforms. So all of a sudden, we've been talking about asset identification, we've been talking about the need for smooth workflows on the engineering side and on the broadcaster side. Well, the advertiser side, the agency side, and the research side are now realizing that the same thing is important to them. Not only that, they, they hired Ernst & Young and said, this is something that's feasible. Well, we've been talking about this, Chris and I did our first paper, what, three years ago? And it's feasible, it's, desi it's desirable, and it's doable. And they came up with six attributes that need to be part of an asset identification methodology. Again, uh, and we'll, you'll see this slide throughout because we're gonna go back to it and say, if these are the things that advertisers and agencies and then the distribution companies and the research companies all need, they're all the same things that we all need here in this room, so we're going to start, I'm going to talk, spend the next few minutes talking about the various domain-specific content identification schema. First one, near and dear to my heart, AdID, which is a web-based system that generates unique identifying codes for advertising assets. AdID has worked very closely with SEMPTI to properly identify it in registries and in standards documents, and in fact, AdID is described by RDD17 in addition, we've already got an entry in the RP210 registry, which in version 12. AdID is the industry standard for identifying advertising assets across all media platforms, sort of a UPC code for ads. If you can't measure it, you can't operationalize it or measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't monetize it. Identity is a key enabler for operational orchestration and measurement as well as management. So at the core of AdID is basic descriptive information. We call it the analog slate. 
advertiser name, product name, brand name, commercial title. These are all things that are being shared today by email, faxes, manually rekeyed from other third party systems. Today, from the time an advertiser actually gives approval to create the ad to the time that the ad actually airs and is invoiced to the agency, the slate metadata is rekeyed up to 20 times, costing the ecosystem $80 million a year. As we all know, all that rekeying is a huge duplication of effort. And as a result, there's human, effort, human error and increased costs. As broadcasters and vendors, there's always a fear that by identifying faults in your customers' processes, your share of a budget will be reduced. By advocating the use of ad ID for ads throughout the supply chain, we make things a lot easier. We embrace standardization without inhibiting creativity. We improve marketing accountability, generate operational efficiencies, reduce human error, and bring value to the advertiser who basically pays the bills. The Association of National Advertisers has a 10-point marketer's constitution. Item five on that constitution says, the marketing supply chain must become more efficient and productive. Last week at the, at the ANA's Masters of Marketing Conference, ANA President and CEO Bob Leodis explained point five as follows. Efficiency is different from effectiveness, but just as important. Marketing efficiency enables us to shorten the supply chain reduce waste, and improve productivity. A fundamental key to the supply chain efficiency is to make everything digital. Ad ID is the industry standard for coding digital assets and implementing file-based workflows across the entire marketing supply chain, from commercial production through distribution and airplay. Fully embraced by the marketing industry, it will improve the accuracy of, of reporting and evaluation of advertising assets affording process improvements and cost savings for everyone. Okay, so I just want to pause on that for just a minute. That's, that, that was all Bob's quote. No editorial commentary there. Think about that. Think what we're talking about for the last couple of days here. File-based workflows. We now have a common vocabulary all the way through our supply chain. Common vocabulary towards a mutually beneficial end. I don't have to rehash the benefits of file-based workflows to this audience. Supply chain excellence is the result of when you do what you do best without duplicating what I've done. And everyone has participated in repeatable, documented industry best practices and made way for other members of the supply chain to focus on what they do best. More than 700 of the top 1,800 advertisers in the US now use Ad ID. Ad ID possesses all of the six attributes that SIM articulates. And we've worked closely with the engineering communities to be properly defined. So last year's Devon Croft Big Broadcast Survey asked a sample of more than 5,600 broadcast professionals about the important trends in broadcast. The study concluded that one of the first, one of the top trends towards critical commercial success in the broadcast industry is the shift to file-based workflows second only to multi-platform content delivery. We all know that file-based workflows are defined as the process of moving digital files through the stages from production to airplay with integration to business systems without tape or significant human intervention. Yesterday, Brad Gilmer referred to this as ingest plus transform plus transfer. These files create all, contain all of the information required, the essence and the metadata, which can include the definition, standard definition, high definition, 3D, the aspect ratio, the AFD, closed captioning, and other descriptive information. In the case of advertising, the ad ID slate. Today, 70 to 85% of cable network commercials are digitally delivered. However, most of the internal workflows are only partially automated. Most of this, these still require conversion and significant amount of human intervention a lower percentage of the national network commercials are digitally delivered. At ID, the Advanced Media Workflow Associ and the Advanced Media Workflow Association 
have an effort underway that enables and accelerates file-based advertising workflows. It's called AS12, the Commercial Delivery File Format, which will not only streamline operations and enable innovative cloud or local workflows, but also reduce overall cost. One key pain point in the current advertising workflows that AS12 is targeted to address is the potential for mismatch that could occur between transactional and business workflow, the purchase and scheduling of spots, and the media workflow that produces the playable, the playable contents of the ad. AS12 aims to reduce the risk of mismatch at reconciliation between the two workflows by embedding the identification information into the content. Both workflows use a consistent identification scheme throughout. So the good news is, sorry, the good news is that the manual workarounds coupled with double and triple checks that we've put into place have minimized the mismatches that take place. The bad news is the workarounds cost you time and money. The same identifier should travel down through the workflows, ideally with a common system of record acting an authoritative source for all associated metadata. Finally, it should be pointed out that AS12 is simply a variant of AS03, optimized for commercials. You may recall AS03 was created and is used today as an application specific specification of MXF, specifically targeted at the, program, the delivery of finished programming from program producers and program distributors to broadcast stations. If all goes well, version one of the AS12 specification will be released by the end of November, and the reference implementations will be available by the end of December. IDER, the Entertainment ID Registry, is a B2B identifier for professional audiovisual content, in other words, long form or episodic content, that's been designed out of the gate to meet the, the requirements of automated workflows and supply chains. As an industry-run nonprofit ID registry, it was built in collaboration among content creators, distributors, and processors. It has an existing system service and data model created to facilitate digital distribution and is governed by industry representatives and the ability to keep the service up to date and responsive to, to evolving industry requirements. It's already being integrated into IT infrastructures at leading studios, cable distributors, metadata vendors, and post-production houses, and digital retailers. IDER is targeted and simple, and it doesn't attempt to aggregate all of the sources of metadata. Its content coverage allows the identification of all audiovisual content for distribution. It's flexible and extensible, governed by industry representation, and it's automated and scalable with lots of a with APIs for automated registration, lookup, and other integrations with software tools. IDER is also a DOI-based um, registry. And if you, those of you know DOI, DOI's already got 40 million scholarly documents within it. And IDER is an open and unrestricted database. We, as we'll talk about with all of these identification schemas, we're, they're all interoperable, and we all make sure that we carry I alternate identifiers and, be, and are ref able to reference all of that stuff. ISAN is an ISO standard equivalent to the ISBN for audiovisual content. Again, designed to be interoperable with all other ISO asset identification schema. So again, let's just, just, to keep remind, just to keep reminding ourselves, the, you know, these are the attributes of asset identification. And again, these are things that came back from, you know, from, the, from, from the taxi initiative. So one of the things that my friend Al Kovalik likes to remind me of is content identification schemas like AdID, IDER, ISAN are all about the CRUD. Create, read, update, and delete, that is. Which are the four basic functions of persistent storage. We heard a paper yesterday about UMIDs. 
And according to SEMPTI 330 definition, a UMID provides a, a method of identification of audiovisual materials and thus enables the material to be linked with its associated metadata. An ecosystem that includes UMIDs linked to domain-specific business identifiers and metadata schema like AdID, IDER, and ISAN provide an efficient full-circle solution to operations, reporting, and measurement and firmly establishes a marketing and communications supply chain environment. All right, so that, uh, I think that helps to give us kind of a foundation for these smooth asset workflows. And um, I'm just gonna wrap up by just going through, there's more than just identification to this, obviously. Once we, once we tackle that and we have uh, proper means to uh, globally uniquely ident identify uh, the various pieces of, uh, of content that we have, we need some other tools to help the workflow along the way. And I'll just give you a quick summary. It, it wouldn't be a, 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 a SIMTI presentation by me if I didn't mention BXF, so I got to put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's known as SIMTI 2021. Um, and, and really that comes into the whole workflow area in more places than people tend to think of. Uh, we, it deals not just directly with the content metadata, which it does, uh, with uh, compatibility to all the schemas that, uh, schemes that you've uh, talked about before here, Harold. Um, deals with content transfer, Interesting, is, the, is that the call, alien call, detection alarm the I hear there? Yeah, or, or is the mothership <laughs> coming? <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know the session's going poorly when the alien wants to leave. <laughs> um, and, and the most popular uh, uses of BXF are obviously in the uh, playout schedule and as run areas. So it, it's yet another tool that you can add to your arsenal in, in enabling these smoother asset workflows. Uh, other speakers have, have certainly talked in detail uh, about uh, FIMS, but uh, I'm going to give a nod to that as being part of this whole ecosystem, uh, being the, the framework for interoperable media services. Um, very important effort, I think, and it's, it's, a, it's a key cog in this whole uh, story of, of smooth asset workflows. And without that, it's really difficult to, uh, to, to make all this work. And you can just see just a few examples of some of the early work uh, that's being tackled, uh, tackled by FIMS um, promises to, to be much more than that ultimately, but it's a, it's a heck of a start. MXF, of course, is a, is a critical part of all this, and um, Harold talked specifically about AS12, but that's not all there is. Um, but uh, again, I won't go into that, but uh, what's the, you know, the real good news to me about AS12 is the fact that it's based on ASO3, which has been uh, nicely uh, deployed already for program delivery. So we've got answers for program and commercial delivery. I talked about that earlier, of us having to tackle both sides of this. Well, we've got both sides of it addressed within MXF. So. Um, or we will shortly. Um, so uh, so that's, that's really good news on the MXF side of things. I talked a little bit at the beginning of the presentation about the challenge uh, of multiple distribution platforms. Um, you know, and again, it just, it just points out the need for these extra tools uh, to, to, to be available for you to, to aid in all this. Um, and if you're not smoothly and efficiently managing your content, um, was it something I said, Bigfoot? I don't know. Without all these tools, you, you couldn't make this all a reality. So, um, and then when we talked, I touched a little bit earlier on, on the advanced advertising bit. Uh, it's not just advertising. It, it's targeted content mm -hmm. in general uh, that, we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, and, and the whole story here is making sure you get the right content to the right eyeballs on the right device, and that's easy to say, it's less easy to actually do. Uh, you're dealing with a much higher volume of uh, both program and commercial content, uh, and, and it's far more specialized than what we're used to dealing with. So again, higher volumes uh, can expose issues uh, with less than efficient workflows. Uh, the good news on that side of things is we do have something called the SCTE 130 suite, uh, which really helps a great deal in the management of uh, targeted content, uh, ad insertion, that sort of uh, thing. And, and there's a, a whole bunch of components to that. Uh, so it's, again, yet another uh, tool in helping you to deal with uh, uh, these new challenges that we've got. 
So in wrapping up, um, I'd like to just kind of say that th these more efficient workflows, they might have been a nice to have uh, in past years. They're a have to have now. Um, you really can't do these really cool things that we're trying to do right now or that we have uh, envisioned for the future without smooth asset workflows. And, um, you know, hopefully we've, we've demonstrated that, you know, it, the whole key of if you can't identify it, well, the rest of it kind of falls apart. So I, you know, I, think, I think Harold dealt with that pretty nicely. There are, there are means to identify it. Uh, once you've got that, there's a whole tool set you can then apply to enable smooth asset workflows all the way through. And, you know, is this the be all and end all? Probably not, but this is what we've got today and all these tools are growing as we go. Uh, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's encouraging uh, that, uh, you know, do they exist? Well, we've, got, we've had some evidence today that two of the three exist and hopefully I've given you enough evidence that you might start believing in the smooth asset workflows side of things. So with that, um, thank you very much. And, uh, We have some questions? Yeah, we have some time. Al? I've got a question for the superior intellect on the panel. <laughs> since you're, you're talking you about come, Harold, right? Yeah, I was talking <laughs> about Harold. Since, but since you come from an advanced culture, can you let us know if stereoscopic 3D will eventually totally succeed beyond our expectations? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we have multiple standards. Isn't that better? All right, any, any other questions? I, I have one quick one for Harold uh, or, or Chris, but uh, you mentioned DOI. I actually don't know anything about that. What, what so is that? DOI is the Digital Object Identifier. It's, uh, it's basically a registry framework. Uh, and uh, what it, it basically, the, it, it, it provides all of the, the abilities for interoperability and uh, uh, separate key values and so on. So it's, as I say, it's a framework that IDER was built upon. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Well, um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to oh. give a, uh, a, a thank you to, uh, to, to my colleagues. Um, Bigfoot got a little warm out under the hot lights out here. <laughs> um, but we've got, uh, that's Jordy Douglas in the back, and this is Fred Baumgartner, actually, up front as the superior <laughs> intellect being. <So> thank you. <laughs>